Welcome to the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. Reformation Fellowship provides support and fellowship for all who would stand for the Reformation of Christ Church worldwide. We long to see the church revitalized by the gospel and seek to encourage all who share that vision. We gather together for gospel-hearted fellowship around gospel-minded theology. Hello and welcome back to the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. My name is Justin Shell. I'm your host. And like everything we do here at Reformation Fellowship, we pray that this time together uh, causes you to delight in God, grow in Christ, serve the church and bless the world. And I think you will very much be blessed with the conversation today with Dr. Michael Haken. Dr. Haken joined us last week to talk about his book, Iron Sharpens Iron, and how gospel friendships impact our lives and our ministries. If you missed that episode, please go back and listen to it. Uh, But today we are going to be talking about how church history serves the church today. And part of the conversation, we'll look at how learning from church history might help pastors in their roles. Uh, But part of it is just how does knowing church history, knowing the um, the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, how, how does that affect our, our walk with the Lord? How does that affect, uh, or how, how might church history inform the way we pray? How might it strengthen um, even the way we suffer when life, this era between the ages, between the second, first and second coming of Jesus, when we do suffer, uh, what has church history taught us about suffering well as Christians? So it's a wide ranging conversation, and and this episode will be a little bit longer than most of our episodes, but I'm really excited for you to listen, uh, for you to hear some of the the input from Michael Haken uh, on this topic of church history for the local church today. So without, uh, without delaying any longer, let's jump in. Dr. Haken, thank you again for joining us here on the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. Yeah, it's a delight, again, to be with you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so last week, uh, listeners, if you missed it, we discussed the book Iron Sharpens Iron, and we, we tried to explore the theme of Christian friendship and, uh, and how desperately we need it uh, in the church today. But today, we, we are going to stick with, with church history, but we're going to broaden our horizons a little bit and try to do a little bit of a survey, not of all of church history, but a survey of areas of the Christian life and how church history can speak into those areas, can encourage us in those areas, and maybe show us um, us a better way (laughs) in some cases. Uh, So, Dr. Hagen, thank you so much for just making yourself available to, to kind of be peppered with Mm-hmm. questions about yeah, church history pleasure. and the Christian life. So maybe I, I thought one of the places we could start, and I want to start here because sometimes in discussions, this is kind of the last thing you hear and no one has time to really elaborate on it. Um, but I've heard many people recommend uh, that Christians choose maybe one church history, uh, a figure from church history to serve as a, as a mentor of a sort, and uh, someone that whose work you become much more fami- familiar with, or their story that you spend more time with, um, is that advice that you give? And what what do you think the benefits are uh, for doing that? Yeah, I sure do. Actually, um, it's an interesting way uh, to begin a discussion of uh, why we should read church history. But um, I think it's a very fruitful way of beginning such a discussion. Um, I probably first came across that uh, statement in uh, John Piper, and uh, mm-hmm. there's a place, um, and I, I'm sure he, he says this a number of times, actually, where Piper records um, an incident in his own life when he was at Fuller Theological Seminary, and uh, Daniel Fuller, I think it was, who was the son of the founder, um, made that encouragement, uh, gave that encouragement to Piper, to, mm-hmm. and maybe it was a classroom setting. Uh, that uh, students, pastors, uh, find a a figure in church history whose writings are extensive enough that they can read them uh, regularly on uh, on an ongoing basis. And this this person can become, as it were, a mentor to them. Mm 
uh, albeit uh, with the Lord, but uh, their writings still speak across the centuries. And I was very struck by that because I think that's <clears throat> enormously helpful advice um, <clears throat> that you cultivate a friendship with one of these figures who has gone before. And um, in my own life, uh, that person would definitely be Andrew Fuller, um, mm. who I mentioned last week, this Baptist pastor who died in 1815, who was so instrumental in the, the development of the modern missionary movement. And um, over the years, uh, he, he, is, he has shaped very much the way I think about a variety of subjects. Um, so for instance, in this recent pandemic um, uh, that we're still in the midst of to some degree, and the, the whole area of political theology mm -hmm. and how to think about the relationship of church and state, uh, Fuller, for me, is a model. Um, he lived in a time of angst and um, challenges because he lived through, you know, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, which issued in the Revolutionary Wars between France and Britain, and then the Napoleonic Wars. Um, he died in the same, only a few weeks, um, uh, uh, well, around the time of the Battle of, of Waterloo. Mm -hmm. um and in fact i think it was a few days before the battle um and so his his whole uh, the much of his ministry was lived under the shadow of war and at one point the impending invasion of england by the french and um how, how does one relate to the state uh, various things were done um habeas corpus was suspended in britain in 1790 people could be arrested and held without trial uh, because of the fears of French uh, invasion as well as um, uh, French spies. And um, uh, Fuller is just a very wise approach to dealing with the, the political tumult of his day. And I found it very helpful, very helpful to think through, how, well, what do we, how do we relate to the state? What do we owe the state? Um, especially when, in my mind, there were some hotheads um, on the North American scene who are arguing, you know, the state's our enemy um, mm -hmm. and uh, really cultivating um, a spirit of disobedience, which in my mind and Fuller's mind would run counter to the, the sort of a perspective that you find in Paul in Romans 13, Romans 14, um, 2 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, um, in the Thessalonian correspondence, uh, etc. So I think I think that's very good advice. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, it has to be a figure who wrote extensively enough that yes, their writings can serve uh, to be a mentor in a, a host of areas. Mm -hmm. And um, in Piper's case, it was Jonathan Edwards, whose corpus is enormous. Uh, thankfully, with Fuller, I, I, I found a figure there that um, is writings while maybe not as extensive as Edwards, nonetheless, um, was a prolific author. Yeah, thank you for that. Let's, um, let's then turn to some of these areas of the, the Christian life and just the, as best you can help us see some of the ways, we're not going to exhaust any of these, but so, some of the ways that church history might inform uh, these parts of the Christian life. So why don't we start with prayer? Uh, how can church history, how might church history help me pray better, if that's <laughs> even the right phrase, might encourage me in my prayer life? Yeah, I, I think of probably along two lines uh, in answer to that question. One is just the, the way we pray. Uh, you come from a Baptist context, as do I, and um, in the course of the 17th century, because the Anglican State Church weaponized the Book of Common Prayer, um, made the Book of Common Prayer a testing ground for, uh, for, those, for all men and women in England, they, they had to go to church where the Book of Common Prayer was used as the vehicle for worship. Um, Baptists found themselves uh, being imprisoned. Uh, John Bunyan, for example, the classic case for refusing to go to the local church because they, uh, Bunyan said, God taught us, teaches us how to pray by the spirit, not by a book. And um, 
that experience, Baptist experience uh, has been transmitted to us in this way that we as Baptists uh, grow up in an environment where we, and we don't think about it, we only engage in extemporaneous prayer. We don't use written prayers. And the reality is that, you know, the argument by our 17th century forebears was that use, the use of a book of prayers written by another man, they're not my, they're not my prayers, they're rote, um, they get us into, a, you know, saying things we don't mean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the reality is we all fall into that, whether, whether we use written prayers mm. or not, we fall into mm. ruts. And one of the ways out of the ruts is to use a book of prayer. And um, so the, I strongly recommend students using in their personal lives uh, a vehicle like the Book of Common Prayer um, as a way of expanding the horizons of their praying and um, helping them uh, to pray better. And so the history of the church then here is a vehicle, uh, a book of spirituality from the history of the church can be enormously helpful uh, in our prayer lives. And then I, I think uh, study of church history um, is the study of, of triumphs and really tragedies. Mm. Um, triumphs, the, you know, the Great Awakening, uh, the Reformation. And how, how do they inform our prayer lives? Well, we, we, I think our great need in certain parts of the larger Christian constituency in North America is re Reformation. Uh, we also need revival. And the study of this history of the church can rem remind us of the great things that God has done in the past and give us a hunger. Um, mm. It was William Carey who once said, you know, um, expect great things from God, attempt great things. And the expect great things, uh, the, his exact phrase was expect great things, attempt great things. Um, and then the uh, from God, for God, uh, being uh, fleshed out as to the meaning of those two uh, phrases. But the expect great things is, is the context of prayer. Yeah. And um, the expectation of what God can do um, is fostered by not only the study of church history. I mean, scripture obviously plays a role here as well, very critical role. But uh, church history can supplement when we see what what we see in scripture, it can remind us, yes, God's hand is not shortened. Um, when times are bleak and seems to be the worst of times, God can bring good things out of such difficult periods. Mm. Um, but also tragedies. Um, um, it, it's a tragedy of enormous proportions that uh, American evangelicalism um, it took a war to end slavery. Um, and that's just a tragedy. Mm. And it's a reminder to us that men and women who, they were evangelicals. They, they share, you know, our faith. Yeah. And yet they indulged in such sin, um, social sin. And uh, it forces us to, to ask the question, you know, search me, oh God. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Mm. And prayer, prayer, prayer then can be enormously helped by the, the study of the history of the church. Uh, that, that, and we, we're not even talking here about the history of prayer. I mean, we, we, we could talk about the history of prayer. You know, the way in which uh, God has used the prayers of men and women in the past. How did they think about prayer? Um, you know, books like John Bunyan's I'll Pray with the Spirit. Despite his... his um, vitriolic attack on the Book of Common Prayer. There's much that is helpful in that book about mm -hmm. what prayer is. And so the, the history of prayer is a kind of subset of the history of the church. So that, you know, that, that could also be a vehicle for helping us in our prayer lives. Before we move on from prayer, Maybe a couple of resources come to mind. You've mentioned the Book of Common Prayer, of course, as, as well as the uh, I will Pray by the Spirit by Bunyan. Are there, is there one or two other resources around prayer in the history of the church that someone might 
might want to explore. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, um, and I, your question has come without preparation on my part. So uh, I, I can't think of the exact title, but there's a book by David McIntyre, a uh, Scottish Presbyterian author at the end of the 19th century on prayer. Mm -hmm. And I forget the exact title. Um, the uh, Diary of Andrew Bonner, B-O-N-A-R, <clears throat> um, in which uh, the Banner of Truth is published. In. It's just a remarkable diary stretching over about 40 years mm. um, of a record of, yes, of various events in his life, but really a, a record of his prayers yeah. because he'll often commit his prayers to his diary. You see, you see how one man prayed. It, it's enormously helpful. There is a um, book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, Praying the Psalms, a little, very little book. Mm -hmm. um, very helpful study in that of the imprecatory psalms. How do I pray the imprecatory psalms? Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so there are the, a number of these um, the resources. Some very helpful books. Yeah. Um, I think that McIntyre book is The Hidden Life of Prayer. Yep, that's it. Does that sound right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, it's one of those books you, you have to, you read a paragraph and you just have to think about it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's a very thin book, but it's a, it's a, it's a classic. Mm. Well, it's good to look at some of those resources for, for prayer. What about the area of um, say preaching? How might the history of the church encourage me? Uh, it, let's say I'm a preacher and encourage me, strengthen me uh, to preach uh, better, more faithful. Yeah, I think I think a bottom line, uh, I think the history of the church uh, reveals the fact that where the church, the times when the church has flourished have been times of great preaching. Mm. And that's I think that's just very important for our day. You know, um, there are various forces at work. Uh, ideas at work in the larger culture as well as the the church life that would want to say well you know preaching it's 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 a it may have worked in the past but it doesn't work in our day um mm -hmm. and that that just is not true mm -hmm. um wherever you find good preaching there is a there is a vital center of of the christian faith and that that, that seems to be a truism of the history of the church um, one thinks of the fourth century with men like, you know, Augustine and, and um, uh, John Chrysostom um, or, you know, the, the Wycliffeite preachers, the Lollards in the uh, 14th century um, or the reformers. Uh, again, to think, to stick to England, uh, uh, Hugh Latimer, just an absolutely remarkable preacher um, mm -hmm. or the, 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 the church flourishing during the 17th century. Uh, with Puritan preaching, um, or again uh, in the 18th century with the uh, you know the field preaching and outdoor preaching of of uh, George Whitfield and um, mm -hmm. uh, the Wesley brothers and William Grimshaw and uh, so on, and so the the history of the church is in many ways a history of of preaching, um, especially in, in periods of of where the church has flourished. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the study of the church, you know, say, you, you, I mean, if you study Calvin's life, for example, I mean, Calvin is uh, preeminently uh, in many ways a preacher. And um, one learns a tremendous amount by studying his sermons, um, his commitment to brevity. Um, he normally never preached more than 40 minutes. Um, his uh, determination to preach the in entire counsel of God um, he would normally in his preaching begin with a book verse one and of chapter one, and then work the way all the way through to the end. Um, uh, Lloyd Jones, Martin Lloyd Jones has probably kind of typified this approach, this expository preaching in his, in our day. Um, but Lloyd Jones didn't develop it. it. It goes, in fact, it goes all the way back to John Chrysostom in many ways um, in the uh, fourth century. Uh, but Calvin really kind of exemplifies it. Um, yeah. Calvin was exiled from Geneva in 1538 uh, for three years because the Genevans who had embraced the Reformation uh, had 
really the leading figures in Geneva had no idea really what the Reformation was going to be about. All they were concerned about was to get free from taxation from Rome. And um, thus they kicked the Roman Catholic authorities out and uh, installed Calvin as the preacher uh, in their main church at the um, Cathedral de Saint Pierre or St. Peter's Cathedral. And um, for three years he was kicked out. And prior to his leaving, um, he, uh, he went to Strasbourg, uh, but prior to his leaving, he was preaching on Job. And uh, when he returned three years later, he spent his first sermon, he spent a few minutes talking about what the Reformation was about and mm -hmm. why the church needed it in Geneva. And then uh, the congregation heard these words. As I was saying in Job, whatever it was, chapter five. <laughs> <laughs> and that it's a great story because it, it just typifies the... His approach, his determination that the yeah. entire word of God had to be preached, mm -hmm. not just this text, that text, which were, you know, the topical preaching that was not uncommon in his day, um, but his determination to preach the entire word of God. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's an encouragement to preachers. Um, his... Um, the way that he preached, uh, the 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 commitment to brevity. Um, um, he felt that if he couldn't have said it in 40 minutes, then it, it, <laughs> he should stop. Um, uh, and uh, the way that he could preach on a single verse, but then do an overview of a chapter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he's just a model of, of, of just fabulous preaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, so again, uh, as you study the history of the church, uh, you come across men like that. Um, granted, you may never be a Calvin, but there are, there are principles here in his life of preaching or in the life of, say, Charles Simeon, uh, who was in uh, Cambridge for much of his preaching career, or Charles mm -hmm. Spurgeon, um, Lloyd-Jones. Um, and what you, what you don't want here is imitation, slavish imitation. You want, you want these men preaching and the study of the history of preaching to be an inspiration to find your own style. But there are certain principles that these men em embody that mm -hmm. I think uh, transcend their own particularity, their own particular historical context. Mm. Yeah. Are there any resources? I, I think uh, probably our listeners ha have heard of some of those preachers, and, and maybe there's a few others that come to mind, great preachers of the past. Are there any resources that have tried to trace um, through church history the, kind of the the fruitful practices of of preaching? Is yes. There a, a oh yeah. You can recommend? Yeah, I mean there are books on the history of preaching. Uh, the one that I, I normally recommend is actually a seven volume work, uh, <laughs> seven or eight volumes by Hughes Oliphant Old. Uh, mm. Hughes, H-U-G-E-S, uh, Oliphant, O-L-I-P-H-A-N-T, and then Old. Um, he, I think he's with the Lord. He, he was a professor at a small Presbyterian school um, on the East Coast and uh, wrote this massive um, series of volumes on the history mm -hmm. of preaching. And um, um, it's certainly academic, uh, but it's not exclusively so. It could easily be picked up by a pastor or one aspiring to preach the word of God and be fruitfully read. Yeah. Um, and he basically goes through the entire history of preaching in, in the church. And um, it really is enormously helpful, um, mm. both in terms of style and content of these various preachers. So um, what you're saying is, someone may need to create a, a um, uh, edited version. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I was thinking uh, there. Uh, scale I was talking, down seven yeah, volumes. Yeah, exactly. They, you know, uh, I don't think he ever did. It'd, it'd be nice if, if he could find a kind of one volume abridgment of those great yeah, works. Um, yeah. But there are, I mean, there's a man in Turnbull. Uh, it's an older work, Ralph Turnbull, called The History of Preaching. And um, I'm sure my listeners may know of others um but yeah. um yeah wonderful well let's um stick with uh, some of the 
responsibilities perhaps of, uh, of the pastor and, uh, and move from preaching but to shepherding, how might uh, a study of church history or, or some writings or stories within church history help me be a better pastor to shepherd people better? Yeah, again, um, there are some fabulous books out there. First of all, in terms of classic books written by pastors about the task of pastoral ministry. Um, one of the first is Gregory Nazianzus, his, what's known as Oration 2 or Sermon 2, um, a long sermon, which he could never have preached because it's just far too long, in which he talks about the pastoral task. Um, he had actually been ordained a uh, a minister, an elder, um, and um, was overwhelmed by the responsibility and the awesomeness uh, to be such a figure and actually fled. Mm. Um, he, uh, he wasn't married. He ran off and uh, but realized he was wrong and came back and, and preached this sermon, um, the, 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 the kind of base, the, the basics of it, um, preached the sermon and um, um, uh, he obviously later expanded it to become this larger work, which we call Oration Two. Um, Gregory the Great, uh, Bishop of Rome in the uh, late uh, around 500, uh, late 500, sorry. Um, he has a book on pastoral care, which is just a gem. Uh, Martin Butzer, uh, it's only just recently been translated, I think it's English, uh, mm. on the kingdom of God. Uh, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a book on pastoral care. Um, obviously, there is the very, very well-known book by Richard Baxter called The Reformed Pastor. Right. Um, and then in more recent, uh, more recently, uh, and in more recent days, I, I edited a volume called Being a Pastor, um, A Conversation with Andrew Fuller, uh, was the mm -hmm. subtitle. And obviously, we're back to Andrew Fuller. Andrew Fuller was a pastor. And he mm -hmm. has left for us the largest collection of ordination sermons by a Baptist preacher in the 18th century. There's about 30 wow. of them. Mm. And so what I did was I edited with two other friends um, a volume, which became Being a Pastor. Um, typically in a Baptist uh, ordination service in the 18th century, there were two sermons. There was a sermon to the candidate or the minister, and there was a sermon to the congregation. And so what I did was I took all of Fuller's sermons to the, to the minister, to the candidate, which amounts, yeah. amounted to about 20, 21 sermons, and um, did a very light edit in terms of punctuation, uh, et cetera, spelling, and uh, did an introduction on uh, pastoral ministry, a um, uh, little kind of sketch of the history of Baptist thinking about pastoral ministry in the 18th century, and then basically just laid out the sermons and mm -hmm. together they, they, they form a fabulous compendium of thinking about Baptist ministry, about pastoral ministry from a Baptist perspective. And um, I wasn't the first to do this. I, I, once I got, once I got underway in this task, uh, I discovered that in the 1820s, uh, a similar thing had been done where somebody had gathered together all of his ordination sermons and uh, issued them as a book with the same mm -hmm. idea, obviously, in mind that this was a, a marvelous collection of uh, pastoralia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I deem it so. And um, so there are some fabulous resources in the history of the church about being a pastor. Mm -hmm. And um, what's helpful about reading the works of figures from other ages, you might think, well, you know, they, they don't face my situation in a post industrial uh technologically savvy um world mm -hmm. you know uh none of these men had computers the internet would have been uh deeply magical or mysterious uh etc mm -hmm. but what these people do remind us is there is there are essentials to pastoral ministry and there are constants that come back again and again and again and there is great wisdom uh, to be to be gleaned uh, from reading these works. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And it's interesting how 
whether it's um, the home visitation ministry of the pastor or the letter writing ministry of the pastor, often it seemed like uh, what we see in church history on on pastoring um, actually is a little more um, multifaceted than we sometimes make it today. I, I think if maybe if I do a decent job preaching and maybe I lead a, an equipping class at my church, I've, I've shepherded well, but it, it seems like uh, so many of the, our best examples uh, were much more willing to step into uh, the everyday ongoing lives of their people. Do, do you notice that as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much so. So, for example, uh, you know, a pastor that comes to my mind is Richard Greenham, not well known at all, G-R-E-N-H-A-M. He was at a little village church north of uh, Cambridge called Dry Drayton um, for most of his ministry. He was there for about 25 years. And then briefly at the end of his life, he was in London. Um, we're talking the late 1500s here. He was a, an Anglican minister, but as often in, in my mind, he would be kind of at the fountainhead of the Puritan movement. He was, he was mm. a Puritan in, in many ways. And one of the things that he would do um, is, because uh, most of his congregation, about 200, 200, 300 people, 50, 60 families, most of his congregation were farmers. And um, he would get up when they got up and um, uh, he would have at the church a morning prayer, according to the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. And then he would go out and walk with the minister, with these farmers. Mm. Uh, if they were plowing, he'd walk with them on the, in the fields mm -hmm. and just talk to them about the gospel or about their own personal lives and uh, counseling. Uh, mm -hmm. Farming life is, uh, you know, especially in the summer when uh, in England, the days are long. Um, would leave little time for these men and women to to engage in that sort of you know pastoral visitation yeah. um, that he felt that he needed. So he went to be with with them when, when where they were at their mm -hmm. occupations. Now uh, I hope he didn't get it. I hope he wasn't a nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, very much so. I mean, pastoral ministry is not simply preaching. Preaching is a central, a central part of it. And as I said earlier, um, the, the history, as the history of the church shows, wherever there has been vitality, there's been vital preaching. But there's a lot more to pastoral ministry than preaching the word of God. Oh, that's good. It's a great story. Yeah. Let's, um, let's transition from preaching, pastoring to um, to sharing the gospel. So this is uh, for, for every Christian. How might church history uh, help me be a better witness to Christ? Yeah, again, uh, the history of the church is in some ways the history of mission, is it not? The, mm. the commissioning at the day of Pentecost, you know, uh, which we find uh, obviously in the book of Acts, but also related passages in, say, John 20. Mm -hmm. um, or um, Matthew 28, you know, the risen Christ uh, telling his disciples to go and make disciples of other nations and so on. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the study of the history of the early church um, is a history of just remarkable expansion. Um, and how did the early church do this? Uh, what did it, how did it, how did it evangelize? Um, what, were the, what were the means? What were the methods? Who were the people um, who were involved in this? Um, the study of that can be enormously encouraging. Um, the area that I've spent a lot of time working in, Andrew Fuller, uh, he stands, uh, the thought of Andrew Fuller and his circle of friends, he stands at the head of the global expansion of the gospel uh, beginning in the 19th century. Um, one of his closest friends is William Carey. And for many years, when Carey went to India in 1793, uh, Andrew Fuller was the secretary of the society that sent him, the Baptist Missionary Society, which was originally called the ba particular Baptist Society for the Propagation of the Gospel among the Heathen. <laughs> and uh, one understands why they shortened it to the BMS, the Baptist Missionary Society. But Fuller was its first secretary. Yeah. And so mission 
I mean, you can't talk about Fuller's life without it being a study of the history of mission. And as I said, it, it's a very important mission because it, it, it begins that globalization of the gospel in recent days. I'm not saying that there was no global expansion earlier. There had been in the, the late antiquity and early Middle Ages with the, say, the Church of the East, um, you know, sending Christian missionaries uh, throughout uh, Central Asia um, or the uh, church in Ethiopia. Um, involved in mission in, in uh, East Africa. But um, in many ways, those, those, those missions had really kind of ground to a halt. And uh, for, for Protestants, anyway, the, the modern missionary movement has its fountainhead with people like Andrew Fuller. And um, so the study of the history of the church is a study of, yes, the growth of the church in, in mission, but also at times when the church wasn't doing mission. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, there are periods when the church seems to be content with uh, what it has achieved and uh, why you can see why, why did that come about? Why was that wrong? What did that lead to in the life of the church? Yeah, I, I know for me, reading the, the history of mission w wakes me up to the, the value of the gospel and yep. uh, how much. Uh, has been sacrificed in many places in many ages to see the good news go from those who have it to those who don't and from places where it, where it's been proclaimed to places where it's not been and so for me it, it's a renewing renews my prayer my intercession at least of my prayer um, renews my my thankfulness for the gospel that it has come to me uh, so it really is, a, I, I think, a personally enriching uh, as well as one that can help me engage in the mission yep. as well. Yeah. Any resources come to mind in this area of, of evangelism of mission? And, yeah, um, there is a book by Michael Green uh, called uh, Evangelism in the Early Church, hmm. which is just a tremendous book. Um, he looks at the you know, the causes of the growth of the church in those early centuries in the Roman Empire. And uh, how did the church grow? Why did the church grow? Who are the people involved in the growth of the church in evangelism? And I think it was originally his PhD, but it doesn't read like a PhD, you know, often PhDs are fairly dense academically, um, mm -hmm. but this is very, very accessible. So evangelism in the early church Mm -hmm. um, there is another book similar to it, uh, Glenn Hinson, called The Evangelization of the Roman Empire, which um, also is a, you know, a companion. Kind of, you could read them both together um, that are very, very, you know, they would be very profitable studies. Or if, if you wanted to read, you know, some individual stories, um, uh, there have been numerous biographies of William Carey as a missionary, but probably the Probably the best as a story is S. Pierce Carey, Samuel mm -hmm. Pierce Carey, who was his great grandson mm -hmm. um, and wrote the life of just simply called William Carey, yeah. um, published today by Wakeman Press in London, England. Um, Adoniram Judson story, which is a tremendous story uh, by Courtney Anderson to the Golden Shore. Mm -hmm. um, again, just a tremendous story. I remember reading it, I, I really couldn't put it down. Yeah. So not only is there other studies of the evangelization of an era um, or the growth of mission in a period, but there are also individual biographies of those called to mission, which can be mm -hmm. very, very. Let's turn our attention from um, evangelization to, uh, to suffering. As we think about um, our own lives, we know if we're not suffering now, there will be, there will be seasons. Um, how might church history help me suffer better? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, one that I haven't thought uh, tremendously about in terms of a history of suffering. Um, uh, I'm thinking now that, I mean, in fact, I don't even know of a book, you know, I, uh, we've looked at, you know, preaching, evangelism, um, pastoral care. I mean, I could easily 
turn your your uh, I, with a little you know time I could easily find uh, a number of books that trace the history of those subjects mm-hmm. but I, I I can't think of a book that traces the history of suffering mm. um, but you're right I mean suffering is a is a normal part of the Christian life and um, uh, there are individual stories like you know uh, Spurgeon for example, um, and uh, his suffering. Um, there have been biographies that have focused on that in mm-hmm. Spurgeon's life. Um, William Cooper, uh, sometimes wrongly said Cowper, he actually uh, specified how his name was to be pronounced, but uh, William Cooper, uh, C-O-W-P-E-R, um, who wrestled with mental illness mm-hmm. for most of his life, and uh, even during the Christian, even during his period of, of his life as a Christian, um, significant mental suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, a Baptist author who I've had a lot of interest in, uh, Anne Steele. She was probably mm-hmm. the most famous Baptist hymn writer of the 18th century. Um, her hymns were a major part of Baptist worship uh, down to about 1900. And then there's a really kind of a, a sea change in thinking about worship and her hymns kind of fall out of favor but um a lot of her hymns come out of the crucible of suffering yeah and so there are biographies of individuals who can be helpful to us uh, in seeing how they traversed uh the travails or travails that came into their lives um Mm. i don't i can't think of a book and obviously there's there's a book waiting to be written on on <laughs> on the on how believers uh, history of how believers dealt with suffering. Yeah, interesting. So, listeners, anyone thinking about yeah. further studies? We've uh, we've just um, made straight your path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. That's that's amazing. That is a big lacuna. Yeah. Yeah, I, obviously there, there's Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is one kind of suffering, um, is a, a major part of uh, the history of the church. But I do think that um, the other areas of suffering that you've already mentioned, mental health, for instance, or uh, we, we've not talked about, um, say, the the abject poverty that many Christians in history and today live in and and how do how do you navigate those challenges so uh, so much to be uh, to be considered there I, I would go back to uh, you mentioned Adoniram Judson uh, earlier as a as in mission but as a sufferer um, experienced the loss of uh, multiple wives of many of his children, as did so many throughout history, um, and to and to hear kind of his watchword uh, following that that the the future is as bright as the promises of God, um, that that it is the the promises, the unshakable foundations of God's word and who He is that undergird all our suffering. Uh, in this life, but mm, yes, uh, students get get to work on this. We're we're waiting to see, yeah, what, <laughs> how you'll serve the church. Um, well, let's finish with one more question, and it's a bit of a church history colliding with, um, uh, with uh, well, with the news today. Um, Many in the West look at their cultures, their, the, the society they live in. You're in Canada. I'm in the U.S. Some of our listeners are, are uh, in other parts of the world. Maybe they're in the Ukraine today. Um, maybe they are in uh, East Asia in a large commun- communist country there. Uh, but Many Christians, I feel like I'm, I'm hearing many Christians today look at their society and their um, 
they may say something like things are getting worse and worse here. There's no, there's no hope. All that God can do is come and judge our land. Um, what might church history teach us, teach Christians who are living in a society that seems to be moving further away from God than closer to God? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, maybe you're talking about the, you know, the study of the history of revival. Um, and, um, you know, the, there's no doubt that in many ways, the, the times that we live in in North America uh, for example, are bleak, um, or other parts of the world, you can see the bleakness of the historical horizon. Um, and yet in the middle of this, uh, uh, frequently when, when times are bleak, and even at the bleakest, um, mm -hmm. God, God acts. Mm. Um, so for instance, the state of the church in the early 1500s was a dire state. I mean, it would, there was a saying in France uh, during the, the, the late medieval period, which ran like this. If you want to go to hell, become a priest. Mm. And you have to think about that against the background of uh, here's a church that has embraced the whole doctrine of purgatory. Uh, from the 1300s onwards, purgatory became a very, very significant doctrine. And mm. what that meant was that everybody who was um, baptized in the church was going to go to purgatory and eventually after working through purgatory, get to heaven. But the saying was basically becoming a priest was so was on the level of denying the faith and becoming a Muslim. Mm. Yeah. I and mean, that's a pretty horrifying statement. And you I think it reflects enough, yeah, to face judgment than, than become yeah. a priest. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and so what was the church like in that period? Well, you know, the corruption, the, the superstition, the uh, biblical illiteracy, the authoritarianism. And yet in the middle of this, God brings about the Reformation. Yeah. Um, or 18th century England uh, between, yeah. you know, the 1680s and the, which really is the decline of the Puritan movement and the 1730s, about two generations, 50 years. Um, of uh, just increasing ungodliness. Mm -hmm. So for instance, one could pick up a newspaper in London in the 1720s and have uh, significant descriptions of, of bordellos and brothels. You could actually pick up a guidebook to London brothels, which not only specified locales, but other details, which uh, one doesn't want to think about. Mm -hmm. And um, the proliferation of pornographic literature and uh, alcoholism and people um, seeking escape in spe spe specifically gin drinking and just mm -hmm. a, just a rank on godliness. Mm -hmm. so, much, so, so much so that when uh, the Victorians who are the beneficiaries of the revival of the 18th centuries, when they came to write the histories of the, bi the biographies of their great grandparents, I'm thinking here of nobility, uh, found themselves just squirming Mm. Uh, because of the the lives that their grandparents had lived yeah. and um usually you know it's the other way around but uh, in the middle of this when england seemed to be at her bleakest um and philosophical arguments for the in terms of apologetics seemed to be making no headway uh in terms of defending the gospel uh, god raises up uh men like um Howell Harris and Daniel Rowland in Wales and, and Jonathan Edwards and Samuel Davies in, in, in America. And mm. Probably the, the man who we call the grand itinerant um, who yoked together all these vehicles of revival, George Whitfield, mm. uh, the Wesley mm -hmm. brothers, and just a whole cadre of, of remarkable gospel preachers and uh, figures to support them. Um, women like Selena Hastings, uh, Anne Dutton, uh, Lady Glenorchy in Scotland, um, Sarah Osborne, um, Phyllis Wheatley, the, the African-American poetess. Mm. Um, it's just a remarkable period of flourishing, but it's preceded by a period of great bleakness. Yeah. And um, uh, one doesn't want to paint that situation too graphically. I mean, there were faithful Christians during the 1700s, 
17 teens and you know 1690s etc um but the church was not flourishing and there are talks about you know christianity's had her day and we need to move on um and just as the just at the very moment that it looked like the church had died and uh, god breathed resurrection power into those dead bones mm-hmm. so um uh and Again, some of this, you know, when people today look out and see these, you know, have a pessimistic view of our culture, uh, some of it's their own personalities, but often it's the culture itself. And mm. it, it's a failure when, we, when we, we think, you know, everything's over. And I, I've, I've seen people say this on Facebook, you know, you know America's done. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just a failure to take into consideration that the, we have a God who raises the dead. Mm-hmm. I think um, I think the history of revival is one of the most encouraging. Um, Agreed. To places to spend your time because it uh, nothing hardly ever helps me pray as as much or or even to long for uh, and delight in just the gospel and and the nearness of of the spirit and so there's so there's so much personal benefit from reading the history of a revival far beyond just concern for my own nation or the nations of the world which are um which are desperately in need of of our prayers as well well dr haken thank you so much for giving us your time for this extended conversation on the benefits of church history for Christians today. I, I wonder if, um, if, there, if there's anything else you'd want to share with us, one last uh, thought on the study of church history, on the benefits of church history, uh, or, or maybe a resource that's recently come to mind as well. Yeah, I, I, uh, bottom line, you, you need to be, as a Christian, you need, you need to be reading the, the history of the church. Uh, mm-hmm. not, not that you become a historian, but for the very reasons that we have we've outlined, if you're a pastor, that you might be encouraged and strengthened in your preaching and understanding of pastoral care, uh, that if you're uh, a believer, a faithful believer in, in a local congregation, that you might uh, be encouraged by what God has done in the past. <clears throat> and we serve the same God. Yeah. And that he can do th- this again, uh, not in the exact way. The past never repeats itself exactly. but. Um, the history of the church needs to be something that we constantly remember um, for, for our good, uh, both the triumphs and the tragedies, as I mentioned uh, mm-hmm. earlier, um, but also um, just recognizing the, how frequently the Bible calls us to remember, remember, remember what God has done. And uh, that remembrance is to extend, obviously, to what he has done in Scripture particularly in the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, but, um, but also in what he has done since uh, the, the, the acts of the apostles, for example. Mm, yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Haken, for giving us uh, your time, not just today, but uh, last week's episode. Uh, we're grateful that you've spent some time with us here on the Reformation Fellowship podcast. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Reformation Fellowship Podcast. We pray that this time together has been a blessing to you. The Reformation Fellowship is a ministry of union. And so all that we do, we hope it helps you to delight in God, grow in Christ, serve the church, and bless the world. If that is your hope, that is your desire, then friends, welcome to the fellowship.